And if you are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, it is all of grace. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You could have never found God in a million trillion years if you had searched for Him and looked for Him your entire life. But the Bible says there is none who seeks after God. No, not one. No, it is God who came and found you. It is God who chose to have mercy upon you and have compassion upon you because it pleased God to reveal Himself to you. He did not make the world reconcilable. He actually reconciled. He he did not make the world merely redeemable. Upon the cross, there was a transaction between the Father and the Son, and He actually redeemed a people with His own blood. What a mighty Savior we have, a glorious Savior, as He propitiated the righteous anger of God toward us. Hallelujah, what a Savior we have. He fulfilled a successful mission of salvation. You shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Free will is a pagan myth of religious superstition. Spurgeon said, I've heard much about free will, but I've never met it yet. George Whitfield said, man has a free will to go to hell, but none to go to heaven. The unregenerate will is not free to choose in Jesus Christ. The will is in bondage to its cruel master, sin, and can only obey sin. This is a closed case. This is irrefutable evidence. The entire realm of humanity is guilty as charged. The mind is darkened, the heart is defiant, the will is disobedient, the throat is decaying, the tongue is deceiving, the lips are deadly, the mouth is defiled, the feet are destructive, the eyes are distorted. And when Paul paints this picture, he says their throat. Every time they open their mouth, there is nothing but the stench of death that comes out of their mouth. Every time they open their mouth, what is down in the heart, the deadness and the decaying heart ruined by sin comes out of their mouth. It is loathsome. It is heinous. It is rancid. What a powerful picture that this is. Graves were never left open. Graves were always sealed up. Why? Because what is down in the depths of that grave is decaying, has turned rotten, is full of worms, is full of maggots. The stench that arises from an open grave is odious, it is foul, it is an unbearable stench because there is a dead corpse down in this grave. And what's down in the heart comes up the throat and then out of the mouth. And it says, with their tongues, they keep deceiving. They can't stop deceiving. And it is a constant and continual lifestyle. Their minds are unplugged by sin. And to describe the gospel to them is to present a glorious painting, a masterpiece to a blind person. As a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And that word foolishness comes from a Greek word moros that comes into the English language as moron. Every unconverted person is a spiritual moron. They do not have the mental capacity to understand spiritual truth. The entire human race has a darkened mind. There is none who understands. And when he says none who understands, he's referring to spiritual understanding of 
who God is and what God requires and who you are and what you so desperately need. There is no one who gets it. None understand their human condition before God. None understand the depth of their own depravity and their guilt. None understand that the grace of God is the only way of escaping this wrath. It doesn't matter how smart they are in school. They are dummies before God. They do not understand the truth of the gospel and their desperate need of it. A defiant heart. There is none who seeks for God. This is representative of the fact they have no desire for God. They have no love for God. They have no passion for God. But do not mistake the gift for the giver. All they want is the gift. They do not seek for the giver of these benefits, that they hate what they should love, and they love what they should hate. And this is true of every unconverted person. They are running away from God as fast as they can. You just simply need to be able to see as God sees. They are going in the wrong direction. They have turned away from God and have turned aside to their own path. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. Together they have become useless. The word useless here is used of fruit that has spoiled. It's just useless for any human consumption. The word is used of meat that has turned rotten. It's used of milk that has soured. The idea really is they have rendered themselves unfit for any purpose of God. Please note at the end of verse 13, he says, the poison of asps. An asp is a venomous snake, a poisonous snake with its lethal, deadly poison with its fangs ready to inject its venom into the unsuspecting victim. The deadly poison of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is like a den of vipers, injecting death into the other bystanders by their slandering, by their lying, by their deceiving whose mouth is full of, please note full of, not just a few drops in there. It's just like bubbling up and spilling over is full of cursing and bitterness. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9, their feet are swift to shed blood. There is so much hatred in their heart towards others. They are swift, like a sprinting athlete running as fast as it can. Not slow, swift to shed blood. And this does not mean that every member of the human race is a murderer physically, but it does mean, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, that you are a murderer within your own heart. Destruction here indicates that as an ongoing habitual lifestyle, they destroy peace within families. They destroy peace within relationships. They destroy the reputation of others. They destroy the livelihood of others. They destroy homes. Their feet are continually pursuing destruction and misery. And misery is the result of the destruction. And if you need any further proof, just go home tonight and turn on virtually any cable news. Get on your computer and just surf the internet and you will see more evidence and more validation for what God is saying in this passage than you can even process or handle. So verse 17, and the path of peace, they have not known. They know no peace with God. They know no peace of God. 
They know no peace with others. It's only destruction and misery that they know. The path of peace they have not known. They haven't even sniffed it. They haven't seen it. For one day of their life, they have no holding God in high regard. They have no awe for God. They have no respect for God. They have no regard for God. There's no fear of God as a template before their eyes as they look around and see. And when he says before their eyes, it's talking about their whole life perspective and their way of seeing life. They don't see God, they see themselves. I remember the day in seminary when my professor asked this question, what can a dead man do? Stink. That is all that a dead man can do. A dead man has no capacity whatsoever to respond. And it doesn't matter how well you could speak to that person, sing to that person, read to that person. They have no capacity whatsoever to respond to you because they are dead. And so it is for the unregenerate person, they have no spiritual life, even in their will, to be able to respond to God and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said it so clearly, no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Further, in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it says, Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. You are not the author of your faith. You are the exerciser of your faith, but your faith did not come from you. If it was left up to you to believe, you would have zero faith whatsoever to put your trust in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who must author that faith. You don't have to teach a little child how to sin. You teach a little child how not to sin. The unregenerate person cannot see and cannot understand the truth. You might as well be describing a sunset to a blind man or a Beethoven symphony to a deaf person. The affections, the desires of the heart have also been poisoned and polluted by sin such that everyone coming into this world loves what they should hate and they hate what they should love. Total depravity means that the corruption of Adam's sin nature has corrupted every part of human nature. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, every inch and every ounce of them has been plagued and polluted by Adam's sin. The will is in bondage to sin. Some Christians, some well-meaning Christians think that only the mind and only the affections are plagued by sin, as though the will is, is uncontaminated, as though the will is an island unto itself surrounded by an ocean of depravity. But the fact of the matter is the will is simply a handmaiden of the mind and the heart. Tell me what the mind and the heart know and love, and I will tell you exactly every choice that the will will make. Wherever the mind and the heart go, the will must follow. The will is the tail, the mind and the heart are the dog, and the tail is not wagging the dog. The dog is wagging the tail. Paul is saying, in and of ourselves, we too have been corrupted by this sin. It's not that we're smarter. It's not that we're better. It's not that we had any advantage or anything going for us that the rest of the world did not have. We've all been poisoned from the same fountain and from the same well, that being Adam's sin. To be under sin is to be under the pollution and the power of sin. It is to be under the control and the curse of sin. From the very moment you were brought home from the hospital, you were already under 
sin. Sin plagued you, sin polluted you. It was in your spiritual DNA. You were born with it. That's the charge that Paul makes here. Paul now presents his case that this is nothing new, that this was all taught in the Old Testament. It's already in your Bible. It was put there long ago, as Paul will now quote the Word of God. This is God's own case that is being presented. There is none righteous, not even one. None meet the divine standard that is required for acceptance with God. God does not grade on the curve. And it really doesn't matter if you're a little better than some drunk who's laying in the gutter. It really doesn't matter if you're a little better than someone who is a serial murderer and is on death row. The fact of the matter is, you and I and the whole world have been weighed in the balances and we have all fallen woefully short of what is required to have acceptance with God. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, the entirety of your personhood is corrupted and depraved by sin. Do you not know? Stop right there. That means this is Christianity 101. He says, do you not know? Are you breathing? Are you saved? Then you know this. Do you not know? You are slaves of the one whom you obey. So in other words, everyone here tonight is a slave. No one's free. You're a slave, I'm a slave. No one is not a slave. It's just not in this room. The same is true throughout the world on all seven continents. He says, either of sin, so everyone is either a slave of sin resulting in death or of obedience, a slave of obedience resulting in righteousness. So if you are unregenerate, the only thing you can do is obey sin. And if you are a believer, the general thrust of your life will be to obey righteousness. Every unconverted person is a slave to sin and to Satan, held in the unbreakable chains by any human effort to be free to believe in Jesus Christ. You and I were in the dungeon of sin, held in the chains of sin, unable to liberate ourselves. Now we know, of course we know this. If you don't know this, where on earth have you been? Now we know that whatever the law says, please note present tense, says, not once said to Moses, not once said in Old Testament times, but the law is still speaking today. And to fulfill the requirements of the law so that every swearing, cursing, slandering, self-promoting mouth may be closed, just shut. As they stand before God, no excuse can be offered, no rebuttal, the entire planet. And so this is the condemnation of the entire human race. It is a slam dunk case. There are no exceptions. There are none excluded from this. There is not one single person, no matter how sweet they may appear to be, no matter how kind they may appear to be, no matter how many old ladies they help across the street, everyone you will ever meet for the rest of your life is in desperate and dire need of the gospel based upon this indictment. It's not enough for someone to feel weak, they must feel wicked. It's not enough for them to feel lonely, they must feel lost. It's not enough for them to be depressed, they must feel that they are damned. No one giggles through the narrow gate. No one in the history of the world has ever been converted apart from coming under deep conviction of sin. No good works, no religious ritual, no good intentions, no church membership, no water baptism, no repeated prayer, no aisle walking, no personal ministry, nothing 
can be added to the work of God in salvation. No one will ever be saved until they know they are utterly helpless and hopeless without the grace of God. No amount of arm twisting, no amount of manipulation can ever talk someone into the kingdom of heaven. It is exclusively a work of God's grace by which he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead are raised from the grave of sin. We must plead, we must urge, we must persuade. You need to know how wicked, how vile, how evil the human race is. And once you understand that, when we then pull out the diamonds of unconditional election and definite atonement and irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints, those truths will explode with light before your very eyes and they will be the most appealing truth that you've ever heard in your life. Without this truth, there is no amazing grace. Then I believe the forgotten member of the Trinity is God the Father. Standing in the shadows, somehow overlooked, has been the one who is the author and the architect of it all, God the Father. He is the one who chose the elect. He is the one who gave them to the Son. He is the one who commissioned the Son to come into this world and to lay down His life for these whom the Father has chosen. Everything is flowing out of that eternal fountain of the infinite genius and abounding wisdom of God the Father. It is God the Father who chose us. It's not the Son, not the Spirit. It is God the Father. And so God the Father here is is given the credit and the glory that He so rightly deserves by the Apostle Paul. It's not on the basis of works, but because of Him who calls those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. The trillion dollar question is, who is the He? Well, it's not God the Son. It was mentioned in verse 29 as distinct from the He. And it is not God the Holy Spirit who is mentioned in verses 26 and 27, it is God the Father who foreknew. It is God the Father who predestined. It is God the Father who called through the Spirit and by the voice of the shepherd, but it was God the Father who was calling. And it was God the Father who justified. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. It is God the Father who takes the perfect obedience of Christ in His sinless life and substitutionary death. It is God the Father who takes that righteousness and imputes it to you, reckons it to your account, deposits it into your account, clothes you with it. It's God the Father. And standing behind this irresistible call of God stands the towering mountain peak of sovereign election. For the Apostle Paul, stands as exhibit A of the sovereign saving grace of God. The Apostle Paul is the poster child for sovereign grace. He was converted by sovereign grace on the Damascus Road with letters in hand, going to arrest the Christians and to drag them back to Jerusalem to stand trial and possible execution when suddenly Jesus Christ appeared to him on that Damascus road and knocked him off his high horse. And he was dramatically, radically, immediately converted. If anyone was converted by sovereign grace, it was Saul of Tarsus. He was not looking for Christ, but Christ came looking for him. And God said of Saul, he 
is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name. And for the rest of his life and ministry, Paul preached sovereign grace. He taught sovereign grace. He wrote sovereign grace. He lived sovereign grace. He said he was the chief of sinners. And that wasn't a false humility. He saw himself as the greatest sinner who had ever lived because he was a blasphemer and a violent aggressor against the church. And with all of his might, he sought to do everything he could to totally obliterate Christianity. The only explanation for the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is sovereign grace. Paul is not some stoic, monotone, lukewarm, apathetic Calvinist His heart is literally breaking for those who are without Christ. And what we see with the Apostle Paul is how he takes the doctrine of sovereign election in one hand and his responsibility and his burden to reach the lost for Christ in the other hand, and he brings the two together And as they come together, it is like gas and fire coming together. And there is an explosion within his own heart and within his own soul. And it is the doctrine of sovereign election that is high octane gas. Now, these truths fit perfectly together. Sovereign election and personal evangelism, they fit together because it is sovereign election that guarantees the success of our evangelism. This truth is taught throughout the entire Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 22, for the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. Jesus said, will not God bring about justice for his elect? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? We are those who have been chosen of God. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith? Now, these verses are like rabbits. They're they're just multiplying. Like you go to sleep at night and you wake up in the morning and they put more verses into your Bible on the sovereign election of God. They're they're, they're just everywhere. In other words, God did not choose his elect based upon anything good that was foreseen in them. In fact, it is in spite of them, not because of them, that God has chosen them. The reason lies exclusively in God himself. For though the twins were not yet born, so the divine choice could not have possibly had anything to do with them once they were born because they were not yet born. And he adds, and had not done anything good or bad. So it is abundantly clear that God is not looking down the proverbial tunnel of time to see what someone is or what someone will do, and based upon what God foresees that person will do or be, God then chooses them as a result of what He foresees. Let me just tell you, God has never looked into the future and learned anything. That that is a pagan myth based upon religious superstition of, of empty minds. The only thing God ever knows about the future is what God has foreordained about the future. It's not anything anything that they have done, good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to His choice, would stand. It had nothing to do with the choice of Jacob or Esau. It had everything to do with God's sovereign choice. It had everything to do with the free will of God not because of works. In other words, they did nothing to merit it, nothing to deserve it, but because of Him who called. And it is the external call that you and I give to our children, to our class, to those to whom we witness. 
But the external call can only go to the ear. It can go no further. There must be the internal call by God the Father that summons and arrests and subpoenas the one who is called and brings them to faith in Jesus Christ. It is this internal call that takes the message that is put in the ear and it brings it from the ear to the heart. Now, there will never be an internal call until there is first the external call. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. But once the external call is put into the ear, then God takes it from the ear to the heart. And then he says, God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Now, God does have a few who are smart and wealthy and schooled in the upper echelon of, of, of education. Yes, those, there are a few of those. God just has to work harder with them because there's too much of them in the way and the despised. Those that the world rejects are those whom God chooses. God chooses those whom the world just turns up their nose and the things that are not. That, that, that means they're just nobodies. They, they, did, they didn't make who's who, they made who's not. I mean, they're just not anything. They, they're zeros with the edges trimmed off. They, they, they have nothing going for them in the estimation of the world. Why does God operate like this? The, the, the NFL doesn't work like this. College football doesn't work like this. I mean, when you go recruiting, you go look for the fastest, the strongest, the, uh, the, the toughest, the meanest. I mean, you, you don't go into the library and look for nerds to build a football team. But spiritually speaking, that's exactly what God does. He takes a bunch of nobodies to go tell everybody about somebody because he gets all the, the glory. So that no man may boast before God. We, we, we have nothing to boast about. You and I have absolutely nothing to be proud of. We have everything to be humble about because as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. It's not me, it's him. Yeah, I totally get God hates uh, Esau. Of course he hates Esau. What I cannot understand is that he would love someone as equally sinful as Jacob and you and me. This doctrine of election is the free and sovereign choice of God made in eternity past to set his saving love on certain individuals, not on the basis of anything in themselves, but solely because of the good pleasure of God's will. This choice by God is a totally unmerited, undeserved choice that leaves every one of us who are chosen scratching our head, dropping to our knees, and saying, why me? Why me? And let us also understand that God does not choose good people to be His people. God reaches to the bottom of the barrel and chooses those who are least deserving to become trophies of His grace so that no flesh may boast in His presence. That is why when you get to heaven one day and you are given a crown, it will stay on your head half of a millisecond and you will immediately cast it back at His feet. God's choices are so often the very opposite of what man would choose and who man would choose. That God delights in choosing the most unlikely people to be His. The birthright went to the older son who was the firstborn, and according to man, the younger would serve the older 
But with Jacob and Esau, according to the sovereign pleasure and the inscrutable wisdom of God, and also to show us to pull back the curtain and to give us a a brief glimpse into how God operates, that God reverses the order and He chooses the one that we would least expect to be His and passes over the one that we would expect that God would have chosen. Just to show us He's still dealing the deck. He's still in control. God's call bypassed the academies of Athens and the rabbinical schools of Jerusalem and the halls of higher education in Egypt. God just bypassed all of the so-called brilliant ones of this world. In fact, the Bible says God has hidden it from the wise and the prudent. You're not going to find it if God hides it. And He's revealed it and the base. It's the last person that you think who would be saved is so often the one that God says, this one is mine. And it's the one that you think has their toes right up to the narrow gate and are ready to fall through it, are so often the one who never enters. Not many mighty, meaning mighty in the things of this world, mighty in riches, mighty in stature, mighty in influence, the kind of people who can make things happen, who can pick up a phone, make a call, and set a city moving in a certain direction. No, God's not interested. God just bypassed so that when God builds His church, nobody can say, well, it was because of their zip code. No, so that only God receives the glory. Then He says, not many noble. Not many in the upper echelon of society. God has just yawned and looked the other way and has reached down to the bottom drawer and pulled it open and said, here are my lottery picks. Here is who I choose to set my love upon. In this order salutis, everything is flowing out of sovereign election. And not a one of them will perish. I lose nothing. To say that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for people who go to hell is to say that Jesus is a bumbling shepherd and that Jesus is full of faults and Jesus has lost that for which He has given His blood and life. No thank you. You may have that Savior. I will take the one who says, I lose nothing. There is no greater subject that we will ever study than the subject of God Himself and His glory. The crown jewel of all theology is the study of the atonement. There is no nobler and no more eminent truth than the saving grace of God in the death of His Son for undeserving sinners. This is the coveted jewel atop the diadem of all theology, the atonement of Jesus Christ. We preach Christ crucified, that Christ Jesus died for sinners upon the cross is an indisputable fact that Christ made a perfect atonement upon the cross that alone is the exclusive way of salvation is an irrevocable truth. And no one can be saved apart from believing that Jesus Christ has died for sinners upon the cross. But the crucial question before us tonight is this. For whom did Christ die? Or to put the question another way, did Christ die for the entire world? Did He die for every single individual who has ever lived before His coming into the world, at the time of His uh, being here, and 
has He died for everyone who would ever live in the history of the world, or did Christ die exclusively for the elect? And what did Jesus actually do upon the cross? Did Jesus actually redeem everyone? Did Jesus actually reconcile everyone to God? Did Jesus actually propitiate the anger of God toward everyone? Did Jesus Christ actually take away everyone's sin at the cross, believer and unbeliever alike? Was Jesus' death an actual atonement? Or did Jesus merely make everyone savable? Did He merely make everyone reconcilable, contingent upon whether or not the sinner repents and believes upon Christ? Do any for whom Christ died suffer eternal punishment? Did Christ die in vain for any? Did He die for those who would never believe? And if so, why? Did Jesus die for those who were already in hell because of unbelief during the Old Testament era? Did Jesus die for those already in hell? And if so, why? I am convinced that the Bible teaches a definite atonement. By that I mean, and theologians mean, and Bible teachers mean down through the centuries that Jesus Christ died triumphantly and that He died exclusively for all who would believe upon Him. And it is also known as limited atonement. Why take world to mean something other than every person in the world? And why take all to mean something other than all people in the entire world? What is the number one reason to believe in the fact, the truth, that Jesus died exclusively for the people of God? The unity of the Godhead. That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all work together in perfect unity in saving sinners. There is perfect harmony and perfect unity and perfect economy. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That is one of the most extraordinary statements in the entire Bible on the sovereignty of God in salvation. It stands as a Mount Everest of truth that is unavoidable to every Christian who reads his Bible or her Bible regarding this towering subject, the sovereignty of God in salvation. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. To come to Christ is to believe upon Jesus Christ. Paul writes, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. This is one of the central and core truths of the entire Bible. It is the truth of the doctrine of election that before time began, God chose those who would believe upon His Son, Jesus Christ. That of all that He has given me, I lose nothing. Jesus would actually accomplish their salvation. He would do far more than make them merely savable. He would do far more than merely remove barriers and obstacles. Jesus would actually save them in His death upon the cross. 
and in His continuing priestly intercession for them, He says, I lose nothing. None for whom Christ died will ever be lost. All for whom the Savior would lay down His life at the cross, He would not lose a single one of them. He is a faithful shepherd. This is the equivalent of Romans 8, 29, and 30. This is a golden chain of salvation. There are no additions and there are no subtractions. All whom the Father has given to me long before they ever came to me, they were given to me in eternity past. I lose nothing and I raise them up on the last day. And it is the Holy Spirit of God who will pursue them and draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only in this manner does the Godhead work in perfect harmony. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him, this is all those whom the Father has given to me. This is all the elect. Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Now, the only way that the Arminian can look at this is very simply this. The Father has chosen all who choose Him. And the Father looks down the tunnel of time and sees who will choose Him. And upon seeing who will choose Him, the Father then, like tag team wrestling, tags them back and chooses them back. So the Father chooses and works with only those who believe. The Son, in going to the cross, works with an entirely different group according to the Arminian scheme. The Father works only with believers. The Son goes to the cross and lays down His life for the whole world. For everyone, a totally different group than the Father who chooses those who choose Him. And then the Holy Spirit, that too is an entirely different group. For the Spirit merely woos. And those who hear the gospel, which is not the entire world, right? So it's a different group than the entire world for whom Jesus died. The Holy Spirit of God gently woos to come to Himself, to come to Christ, those who hear the gospel. So here are the three members of the Godhead, and here are the three entirely different groups that they work with. The Father with those who choose the Son, the Son with the entire world, and then the Holy Spirit with only those who hear the preaching of the gospel, whether they believe or do not believe. No, it is the Arminian view that fractures the Godhead. It is only a definite atonement for those chosen by the Father that preserves the unity of the three members of the Trinity in accomplishing salvation. To deny definite atonement is to deny the unity of the one saving purpose of the Godhead. Christ went to the cross and laid down His life for the sheep. Not for the goats, but for the sheep. Not for sheep of another fold, but exclusively for the sheep that belong to the household of God. The Jews then gathered around Him and were saying to Him, How long will you keep us in suspense? And there is a note of sarcasm in that. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Their unbelief is blatantly obvious. They are coming close to even taunting and, and mocking the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they testify of me. But notice verse 26, but you do not believe 
because you are not of my sheep. Now, the Arminian says it the complete opposite. He says that you are not of my sheep because you do not believe. But Jesus said it correctly. Jesus said, no, I'll tell you the reason why you don't believe in me. And the hardcore reason is the doctrine of reprobation. It is because my Father has passed over you. And my Father has chosen not to save you. And to leave you in your sin. And to leave you in darkness. And for your heart to remain hardened. That's why you don't believe. The reason? Because you're not one of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. If you were one of mine, you would hear what I'm saying and it would ring true in your heart and you would fall to your knees and you would humble yourself and you would commit your life to me having repented of your sins. My sheep hear my voice. I and the Father are one. Those whom the Father loves, the Son loves. And those whom the Father rejects, the Son rejects. And that which the Father pursues, the Son pursues. And that which the Father refuses, the Son refuses. They are of one essence. They are of one attribute. They are, they are one. But in addition, built upon that, it is implied here from verse 28 and 29, they are also one in mission, one in purpose, one in direction. They, this is like two parallel uh, uh, rails on a, on a train track. They are running perfectly uh, in parallel fashion together. Verse 29, My Father who has given them to me, referring to these sheep, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. If Jesus would go purchase the salvation of any other group, He would be working in disharmony with the Father. And as Jesus leaves heaven and comes to this earth, he will pursue the eternal purpose and the eternal decree of God in saving the elect. And what will not happen will be this. The Father will choose His elect, but the Son will certainly not come into this world and say, well, I'm going to die for another group. I'm going to go ransom someone else. You have your elect. I will go to the cross and I will die a death of a different scope. All whom the Father gives me will come to me. And tonight, if you are in Jesus Christ, you may know that it was the Father's intention in eternity past to save you and it was the Savior's effort upon the cross to save you with great intentionality and it was the Holy Spirit of God who opened your eyes, opened your ears, opened your heart and brought you to faith in Jesus Christ. Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his arms. Tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see Him there Who made an end of 
of all my sin because the sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the dust is satisfied to look on him in pardon me before him there the risen lamb my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory and of grace one in himself i cannot die my soul my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. The greatest display of the power of God is seen in His saving works. Greater than God's work in physical creation is His saving work in His new creation. Greater than God calling light into being is His causing gospel light to shine into the darkened hearts of men. Greater than God moving mountains is His removing the heavy load of sin from the human soul. Greater than God forming man from the dust of the earth is His reforming him from the depravity of his sin as he saves his people from their sins. Only a God who is omnipotent can display such sovereign power. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The reason that you are a Christian, if you are saved tonight, is not because you sought the Lord. The Bible says there is none who seeks after God, no, not one. The Bible says we all have gone astray like sheep. Each one of us has turned to his own way. No, God was the great initiator, and it was God who not only bought us, but it is God who has brought us to himself. And it is this powerful, effectual call that has laid hold of us and drawn us to faith in Jesus Christ. That all power belongs to God is clearly taught throughout the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the doctrine of divine omnipotence, that attribute of God by which He possesses all power and is therefore able to do all that He pleases and purposes to do. In other words, there can be no opposition and no resistance that could ever hinder the eternal purposes of God because He is a God of all power. The scripture asserts in Exodus 15, 6, Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Job 9, 4, He is mighty in strength. The psalmist in Psalm 42, verse 8, The Lord strong and mighty. Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their hosts. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. He made his power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. The prophet Isaiah said, There is none who can deliver out of my hand. God is the speaker. I act, and who can reverse it? 
the prophet Jeremiah, Ah, Lord, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is difficult to you. And Revelation 1 verse 8 identifies God as the Almighty. He is Almighty. The power of God was clearly seen in His act of creation. God spoke and everything came into being out of nothing by the sheer word of His sovereign authority and power. Moreover, the power of God does continually sustain and uphold all of the works of His hands. All creation is under the sway of His power. Divine omnipotence governs all of human history. Paul is setting forth the soul-saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where did the gospel come from? Who authored it? Whose gospel is it? It is very clear that God is the author and the owner of the gospel. The gospel is God's saving message. This gospel has come from God. It has been authored by God. It did not originate with man. It has not come from any church or any denomination. The gospel is a supernatural message that comes down from above. It is God's property. It is God's saving declaration. And none of us are allowed to tamper with this message. It is God's saving message that has been entrusted to us, that has been preached to us, and it is God's solution to the human dilemma of sin. And because it is God's gospel, it bears all of the properties of God Himself. It is an authoritative gospel because it comes with God's authority. It is a powerful gospel because it comes with God's power. It is a gracious gospel because it comes with God's grace. And none of us are free to alter the language. None of us are free to negotiate the terms. This is God's message. And to alter the gospel, one must give an account of himself to the one who has authored it, God Almighty. Now, this gospel is not a trendy theological fad to appear today and be gone tomorrow. Oh no. And the gospel of the Old Testament is the gospel of the New Testament. There is only one saving gospel that runs from cover to cover in the scripture. It is the gospel of God. And all of the way through the Old Testament, it is the prophets who looked ahead and spoke of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by prophecies and by pictures and by types and by allusions. The entire Old Testament pointing ahead to the coming of this Christ who would be set forth in the gospel. The entire Bible speaks with one voice, presenting but one way of salvation, revealing but one plan of redemption, saving but one people of God. But by His power, He will act to bring to Himself a people for His own glory. Well, listen, you cannot preach the gospel without preaching Christ and Him crucified. You cannot share the gospel with another person without presenting the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we talk to others, about the Christian faith, we have not shared the gospel until we speak of the person and work of Christ. His virgin birth, His sinless life, His substitutionary death, His bodily resurrection, His present exaltation at the right hand of God the Father. And let me be quick to say that there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is our responsibility to proclaim the gospel, but God guarantees the success of His own gospel.
The gospel will triumph in the hearts of people because God will sovereignly and powerfully call out a people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to raise it back up again. He had prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection. He said, it took you 40 years to build this temple, and it will be torn down, and I will be raised up in three days. But he spoke of his own resurrection. It was the declaration of God from heaven that this is my beloved Son who is fully God. He alone, able to die upon that cross and be equal to God, be equal to us, and to bring the two parties together in His saving death upon the cross. This is the very heart of the gospel the death of Christ, substitutionary death for us as sinners. As our mediator, Jesus Christ offered the perfect sacrifice for our sins. As he offered himself in our place, our perfect atonement. The perfect sacrifice was a once and for all sacrifice that he has made for us his people. The Bible says He makes us willing in the day of His power. It is a call that is an internal call, the call of the Spirit. It is an individual call as He calls us individually, each and every one of His elect. It is a powerful call that overcomes all human resistance. And it is a divine call. It is a summons. It is that call which arrests and apprehends the heart of the sinner toward whom it is extended and brings them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. No, Paul puts this truth out on the very front doorsteps of this book for all who pick this up to read it, to make known this sovereign call of God that guarantees the success of the gospel as we witness for Christ. Listen, our responsibility is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We are to preach the gospel to every living creature. We are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to go in the highways and the byways and lift up our voice and to speak of Jesus Christ. But God goes before us, and God works powerfully in the hearts of people. And there are a people who have been appointed unto eternal life. And when the gospel comes to their hearts, God will work powerfully and God will draw them to Himself. This is what He speaks of to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. And it is this call of the Spirit that opens blinded eyes. It opens deaf ears. It opens closed hearts. And it activates dead wills. And without this powerful call of the Spirit, our gospel witness would be in vain. The total depravity of the human heart will always resist the free offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God must call, and this guarantees the success of the gospel. Because the gospel is so compelling, it makes demands of each and every one of us, and it calls for our unwavering allegiance and loyalty. The gospel can never be a side issue in any of our lives, and Paul realizes that the riches of heaven have been entrusted to him in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and now there is a stewardship involved in being one who has received the gospel, and he is under obligation to God to spend the rest of his life proclaiming this gospel, but we all feel under obligation 
to God with the gospel because we have received the riches of salvation in this gospel and we must now take it to others who are under great need. Now listen, Rome would be the, the most difficult city in the known world to go and to bring a different message. Rome was a place of Greek philosophies and many different ideologies and pagan gods. But Paul says, I am eager to come to Rome and put the gospel up in the marketplace. We have received the gospel to, to proclaim the gospel. We have been called out of the world to go back into the world. Paul tells us in no uncertain terms why he is so eager and why he is so confident to share this gospel message far and wide. And so Paul, as he writes, he wants to put steel into the faith and into the backbone of these early believers. You and I ought to be filled with confidence and we ought to be filled with great boldness regarding the gospel. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This word power speaks of the dynamic, explosive power of the gospel to save sinners. It is the most powerful message in the history of the world. It is the only message by which salvation comes to lost sinners. It is a message that is so powerful that even the chief of sinners will melt down under the sway and influence of this gospel message. The Apostle Paul himself stands as Exhibit A, a trophy of God's grace, how the gospel had conquered his own once proud pharisaical heart until that day the gospel exploded in his soul and he was radically changed and transformed from the inside out never to be the same again he is not saying that the gospel is about god's power nor is he saying it is just a source of god's power he says the gospel itself is the power of god when it is brought to the human heart and accompanied by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so powerful, no one beyond the saving power of the gospel. No one gone so far into sin, but that the power of the gospel is not yet greater to remove their sin and to clothe them in the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bring a message that is so powerful that no one is beyond the saving power of this gospel message. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, quote, It is of God's mighty working. It is God Himself doing this thing, not simply telling us about it, but actually doing it. Listen. We all have two unmistakable appointments, death and judgment. And there is a final judgment. And Jesus Christ will preside over that final judgment. And He will render to every man according to their deeds in that last day. Unbelievers are storing up wrath until the day of wrath. Jonathan Edwards described it this way, the flowing river of God's wrath is presently damned up by His mercy, and it is being held back by His mercy. But the longer it is being held back, that wrath is only building and growing and increasing. And in the final day, God will remove His grace, and that wrath will consume sinners in the last day. And they will be the object of His vengeance forever and ever and ever in a real place called hell. Every person needs to be saved from God Himself, from the wrath of God that will be poured out. This is the good news, that Christ upon the cross has stood in our place, and as He bore our sins, 
He absorbed the wrath of God that was due us, and that there is now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. This is the strength of the gospel, and only God himself can save us from himself. This is the saving power of God, and it is contained exclusively in his gospel, the gospel of God. It is rooted and grounded in the prophets in the Old Testament. It is centered in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. This is the power of God in salvation, that He can take lost, ruined, corrupt, depraved, defiled sinners who are justly under His wrath and condemnation and forgive us and pardon us and clothe us with the perfect righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, and impute to our account the perfect obedience of Christ to every point of the law. It is the power of God unto salvation that comes to the life that believes exclusively in Jesus Christ. It is this gospel that is offered to the world. It is this gospel that is offered to sinners. And all who will believe upon Christ are those who are made the object of the power of His saving grace. May all here tonight who have believed upon Jesus Christ May we take this gospel far and wide to every person and every creature. And if you find yourself here tonight and have never entered through these gates into the kingdom, there is only one way of entrance into the kingdom of God. It is through the narrow gate who is Jesus Christ. You must come repenting of your sin. You must come believing upon Jesus Christ. And it is in your faith in Christ alone that you receive this gift of his perfect righteousness. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Spurgeon said, I love God's shalls and wills. There is nothing comparable to them. Let a man say, I shall... What is it good for? I will, says one man, he never performs. I shall, he says, and he breaks his promise. But it is never so with God's shalls. If he says shall, it shall be. When he says will, it will be. Now he has said here, many shall come. The devil says they shall not come, but they shall come. You yourself say, we won't come. God says you shall come. Yes, there are some here who are laughing at salvation, who can scoff at Christ and mock at the gospel, but I tell you, some of you shall come. What you say, can God make me become a Christian? Yes, I tell you, for herein rests the power of the gospel. It does not ask for your permission, it gets it. It does not say, will you have it? but it makes you willing in the day of His power. The gospel wants not your consent. It gets it. It knocks the enmity out of your heart. You say, I do not want to be saved. Christ says, you shall be. He makes your will turn around, and then you cry out, Lord Jesus, save me or I perish. Ah, uh, might heaven exclaim, I knew I would make you say that. And then He rejoices over you because He has changed your will and made you willing in the day of His power. Close quote. All glory to God. We ought to stand on our heads and clap with our feet about that. What a glorious God we have. Not only does He offer the gospel, but He works both sides of the aisle and he knocks on the door of your heart, then he comes around into the back door, he opens the back door, lets himself in, and he comes in and opens the front door himself to let himself in. This is sovereign grace. 
This is the salvation of which Christ came into the world to secure. This is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I want to say anything else is a mere figment of man's fallen imagination. I must, they shall. What good is it to be chosen of the Father before the foundation of the world if in the end you die lost? What good is it to be redeemed by the Son with a definite atonement if in the end you die lost? What good is it to be effectually called by the Spirit and to be begotten by the Spirit in the new birth if in the end you die lost. The biblical truths of election and redemption and regeneration are all sweet, knowing that in the end, all whom the Father has chosen, all for whom the Son has died, and all whom the Spirit has regenerated will in fact spend all eternity with the Father. Now, I know someone will say, well, I once knew someone who prayed a prayer and committed their life to Christ, and, and then they have fallen away. And, and so what would you say about a person like that? I'm glad you asked, because I would say that person was never saved to begin with. Because the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. A true believer will persevere in their walk with the Lord because it's not a matter of you holding on to God it is a matter of God holding on to you and that is a world of difference as Charles Haddon Spurgeon said Noah fell down many times in the ark he never once fell out of the ark this salvation is a work of grace from which we can never fall away that we are as certain for heaven we who have believed upon Christ as though we have been there 10,000 years. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Uh, this is a very clear statement that all of God's chosen ones, His sheep, will hear not just the voice of the, sh of the preacher, and not just the voice of a parent or a Sunday school teacher, but in the presentation of the gospel to the sheep, they will hear more than just a human voice. There will be the effectual call of God, and they will hear the voice of the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this voice of the Lord Jesus Christ is so powerful that it can never be rescinded and it can never be resisted. And this effectual call, listen to this, it is an irrevocable call. It is an irreversible call. All whom He calls to Himself, He continues by the power of His voice to preserve them in a state of grace. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. Uh, this word know, gnosko, means to enter into a personal relationship with. It, he does not say, I know about them. Uh, this is far deeper. This is far more intimate. That he actually knows each of his sheep. And he said earlier in verse 3 that he calls his own sheep by name. It is not an audible voice that one hears. It is much louder than that. It is much louder than, than an audible voice. It is the sovereign call of the Lord Jesus Christ by which He calls His sheep to Himself and He calls them by name. He says, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must dine with you tonight. He says, Matthew, come and follow me. He says, Lazarus, come forth. There was that day, there was that time 
when the Lord Jesus called you to himself, you were arrested, you were, you were apprehended by the Lord, and he drew you powerfully, and he brought you to himself. And they follow me. Please note, that is a statement of fact. There are no conditions given here. This is the certain response of the sheep to their good shepherd once they are made to hear his voice. He calls, they come, they follow. Christ's sheep hear his voice, they hear only his voice, and they follow him once they hear his voice. And they are never going back to strangers. They are no, never going back to the dead religion of, of this world. They are never going back to any false shepherd. All of Christ's sheep are branded as belonging to him. That there are two marks on every one of Christ's sheep. The mark on the ear is that that one hears the voice of Christ. And the mark on the foot is that one follows Christ. It's obvious who are the Lord's sheep. They bear the double mark. They have the mark on the ear and the mark on the foot. They are those who hear the voice of the shepherd and they follow after the shepherd. So I want to ask you tonight, are you one of the Lord's sheep? Do you hear the voice of the shepherd? Are you following after Christ? Every sheep of Christ bear this double mark. I give, not that they earn, but He freely gives, by His grace, eternal life to them. If you received grace and then you lost it after 10 years, you never received eternal life. If you could be a follower of Christ for only 10 years and then fall away, what you received was 10-year life. But this says He gives to us eternal life. The salvation is not just getting man out of hell and into heaven. It is getting God out of heaven and into man. Eternal life is new life. It is spiritual life. It is supernatural life. It is divine life. It is abundant life. It is the life of God in the soul of a man. It is the life of eternities come to indwell us. He's not giving us a one-year contract that He renews at the end of each year. And I give. That's present tense. Not will give, but I give right now. Present tense. Eternal life. To them. Do you see the present tense of, of eternal life? William Hendrickson, the great commentator, writes, The life which pertains to the future age becomes the possession of the believer here and now. God does not give eternal life once I reach heaven. Like, if you can just hang in there and hold out to heaven, once you enter into the throne room, then He will give you eternal life, and only then will all eternity be settled. That I give, present tense, right now, eternal life. No, you and I presently are the possessors of eternal life. Listen to these verses. John 3, verse 15. Whoever believes in Him will have eternal life so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life right now John 3 verse 36 he who believes in the Son has eternal life right now I already have eternal life John 6 47 truly truly I say to you he who believes has not will have has eternal life John 6, verse 54, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Your destiny is forever settled in glory and it is all of grace. And they will never perish. 
I've done a study of this in the original Greek, and this is exactly what it says. And they will never perish. Read my lips. What part of never do you not understand? I think we understand what it means to perish. It means to be eternally lost, to be eternally punished. It means to suffer eternal destruction in the flames of hell under the relentless wrath of God. But Jesus said, not one of his sheep will ever perish in the bowels of perdition below. Were even one sheep to perish, that would make Jesus a liar. But the fact is that not one of his sheep will ever perish. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There it is in the very words of our Savior, His sheep will never perish. If He were to lose one of His sheep, He would not be the Good Shepherd. He would be an absent-minded shepherd. Uh, he would be a, a misguided shepherd. But He is the Good Shepherd. He begins with 100 sheep in eternity past. He ushers all 100 sheep into the presence of God forever. How many times does God have to say something before it is true? Just one time. And He does not owe us even an explanation. Christ holds all of His sheep securely in His omnipotent hand. It would take another hand that is stronger than His omnipotent hand to pry it open and to pull us out but Christ has all authority in heaven and earth. He has all power. No one can seize us from His hand. No one. Not Satan. Not demons. Not false teachers. Not temptations. Not false prophets. Not even ourselves. We are held in the sovereign grip of His saving grace. No hand is stronger than His omnipotent grip on us. As I've said, only one who is greater than Christ could remove us from His hand, but none is greater than the King of kings and the Lord of lords. None can pry open His grip. None can release His, his strong hold of us. He is holding us in His own hand. It's not that He has handed us off to one of the angels for one of the angels to babysit us, for one of the angels to, to watch over us, to one of, for one of the angels to, to lay hold of us so we don't ever slip down into the pit of hell. No, this says, Jesus said, that we are forever held by His own hand. Uh, he's not a fumbling, bumbling shepherd. Uh, and if he loses a couple of sheep like a businessman who would say, well, that's just a write-off for the business. If we lose two out of a hundred, that's pretty good business. Now, each one of us are individually important to the Lord. Now, verse 29 makes this doubly secure and says we are held by the Father's hand. We are doubly sealed. The fact is, by the Holy Spirit, from other texts, we, are, we have a triple seal. Who, who could be greater than God the Father? Who could be greater than the great I Am, the great Jehovah, the great Yahweh, the great Adonai, the great Elohim? Who could be greater? It doesn't matter what some, some uh, opponent or enemy or foe would say against you before Almighty God, the gavel's not in their hand. God is behind the judge's bench. God is the one who justifies. God is the one who pronounces that we have the, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one, no one, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. 
Christ's sheep are held in the hand of Christ, and then it is as though the hand of the Father encapsulates and surrounds the hand of Christ. An Irishman was being kidded about his continual preaching of the doctrine of eternal security by one who said, what if after all your preaching of this doctrine, you could actually lose your salvation? The answer immediately came, God would lose much more than I would. I would only lose my salvation. God would lose his reputation. Because God has said and pledged by his word and sworn by his own holiness that not a one of his sheep will ever perish. We have the word of God on it. Let every man be found a liar. Let God be found true. I and the Father are one. That is to say that the Father and the Son jointly guarantee the eternal security of all the sheep. Now the word one, I and the Father are one, is not in the original language, is not in the masculine, it is in the neuter. If it was in the masculine, it would mean I and the Father are one person. But it's not. It has nothing to do with person. It has everything to do with purpose and mission and goal and aim. And this is another way of saying that we are jointly held by the sovereign grace of the Father and the sovereign grace of the Son, and they are one in their saving enterprise. They are pulling together. They are not canceling each other out. The Godhead is perfectly one. They are of one will and one decree and one purpose. Jesus said, this is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have, present tense, eternal life. Jesus is saying the Father and I are of one will and one purpose in matter of salvation. And as Christ has come down from heaven to the earth, He remains of one aim and one goal with the Father. And the Father in eternity past chose His elect, He gave them to the Son, and fast forward all the way to eternity future, Jesus said, I will raise them all up on the last day. It is a resurrection unto life. Those whom He began with in eternity past are those whom He concludes with in eternity future. None are gained along the way, none are lost along the way. Do you see how protected you are in grace? No matter how the temptations of this world may rage, no matter how deceitful Satan may be, no matter how many false prophets and false teachers will be unleashed upon this earth, no matter how weak you are in and of yourself, this is cause and reason for every one of us tonight to rise up and bless the name of the Lord. This is reason for every one of us here tonight to humbly bow before the Lord and say, salvation is of the Lord. None of us serve out of a sense of fear that what I do for the Lord, I must do in order to keep myself saved. It is the total opposite. I am now motivated to wake up every morning and put both feet on the floor and to burst forth into this world and to be determined and motivated by His grace. I will go wherever He leads. I will follow that voice wherever He takes me. I will be bold. I will be courageous because I am secure in grace. I am preserved in grace. And I can approach even my deathbed fearlessly 
How could we ever come to be the sheep of such a glorious master as the Lord Jesus Christ? No sheep were ever so dirty as we were. And no sheep have ever come to be the possession of such a good shepherd. If you have never believed upon Jesus Christ and not act by faith, this moment, now, and in your heart of hearts right where you sit, say silently to the Lord who is with us today, Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. You died for sinners. You are a physician who came not for those who are well. You came for those who are sick. Have mercy upon me. And Jesus says, him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out.